Hello and welcome back for our third webinar of the OSU Small Ruminant webinar series. My name is Christine Deli. I work in the Noble County OSU Extension Office and I serve uh, in a couple of different roles for the sheep industry. It's a pleasure to be here with other members of the sheep team to put on this webinar series. Tonight, we're going to have multiple presentations. We will cover everything from weaning and sorting lambs into groups for feeding and marketing later to market reports and making important culling decisions that will benefit your flock or herd in the long term. Tonight's pres presenters include Tim Barnes, Jackie Smith, Brady Campbell, and Dalton Hoonan. Dalton will be presenting with us. He is part of our research staff at the Eastern Agricultural Research Station. And we look forward to sharing all of these presentations with you. We'll be starting first with Brady's presentation on weaning, weaning and sorting lambs as we head into one of our prime markets for our industry. Brady, you have the floor at this point in time. We're very good. Thank you, Christine, and thank you to all of you that have joined us this evening. It's certainly been a lot of fun to be able to have a, a series of webinars to be able to interact with you all, especially given the uh, the circumstances of, of the times here recently. So to wrap up our, our discussion here, I think we, um, you know, this really tells a, a nice story from where we began a few months ago in January, all the way up here to the management of weaning uh, of these animals from weaning to sale. So I think really what I want to do is want to begin our discussion on, you know, weaning and, and why are we performing these, these weaning strategies. First and foremost, uh, it comes to space requirements, especially here in the eastern United States. We are limited in terms of the uh, area available for grazing, but if you're lambing during, uh, you know, December, January, February, and even into portions of March, we typically aren't going to be lambing outside due to harsh environmental conditions. So thinking about as those lambs age, mature, grow in size, we are going to have a reduction in space per animal within our barns. Resources, and those simply are anything from our feedstuffs that we have stored on hand to be able to feed to our animals, as well as some of our bedding materials. So definitely when we think about having this barn full of, you know, twice or three times as many sheep as what it's normally uh, used to handling, we may go through a lot more of our resources that we have on hand. Again, we've already discussed the issues with some of our environmental conditions, you and doe management for our goat, goat producers as well, right? Uh, certainly decreases, uh, decreases the demand on, on the female's body. So if we're able to wean these um, offspring, our, our lambs and our kids from our ewes and our does, we certainly are able to allow them to get into a better body condition score. They don't have that demand of lactation. We can also improve offspring performance, and there are some conflicting ideals behind this, but if we're able to get this animal to adjust to a, um, a grain-based diet or even a mixed diet of grain and haze, we may be able to uh, promote the proliferation of that rumen environment and able to kind of jumpstart that animal pretty quickly, as you know, Tim Barnes discussed in one of our previous discussions with creep feeding. We also uh, have literature that states that it may improve the efficiency of our operations. Certainly, we can understand this from the standpoint of accelerated breeding systems. If we're able to get those um, lambs and kids weaned off of our females, we're going to be shortening that breeding cycle. We're able to get more out of those animals. And then also, there's an efficiency in, in feeding strategy. Um, think about where these lambs and kids are learning how to eat from. They're doing it from their dams or from their mothers, and they love to get into the feed bunks with those ewes. So rather than having that competition of the ewes and the lambs or the does and the kids amongst that feed bunk, or having that you consume potentially that more pricey feed stuff in terms of grains and maybe expensive haze or high quality haze, we take that out of the equation, feed those use more of a maintenance diet or a maintenance ration of lower quality feeds that still meet those maintenance demands, and then put those more expensive feed stuffs into our growing animals. And then also market demands, you know, whether that requires you to wean or not based upon your marketing strategies. How are we going to wean our animals? And there's really no best age to wean at. Uh, a lot of my formal training during my master's degree comes from grazing, parasitology, as well as behavior and welfare sciences. So we're pretty keen, at least in my lab, in, in understanding the ill effects or, or, so, or negative effects associated with weaning and weaning stress. But as we think about these different strategies, you know, what ages can we implement in terms of weaning age? 
we can certainly wean at day one through 30, and that's going to be considered some of our really early weaning strategies. These may be popular in some of our dairy operations, both sheep and goats, uh, and also with our bummer lambs or our bottle fed uh, lambs or kids as well. In these situations, we recommend that these, um, these animals be fed for 30 days of age or up to 30 pounds in live weight. We can also wean at 60 days of age, and that's pretty common for us here in the eastern United States. Um, it's one of them that's that's preferred. Uh, there's no animal, there's no real scientific data. It's just anecdotal, and uh, the reason behind this is that just for generations, we found that that's one way that we're able to improve the efficiencies of some of our operations. And again, it'll increase the uh, solid feed intake of your offspring as well. 90 plus or 90 to 120 days of age. Uh, this is gonna be more common in some of our pasture-based systems or some of our Western range systems where they have a bountiful amount of forages available for these animals to graze on. The resources certainly aren't limited. And also we can think about our specialty markets. And then I've also got the question down here of natural weaning. Uh, there's a really nice paper by Arnold and others from 1979 that describes uh, the process of natural weaning. And that can be anywhere from about 150 to 180 plus days of age of these animals. Of course, with some of our more natural or wild small ruminants, perhaps the moved lawn, which is the ancestor or the bighorn sheep of our domestic sheep breeds themselves, they're certainly going to have an extended weaning period. But weaning can be highly dependent upon resources available to that uh, dam during lactation? Is she able to sustain lactation? And also uh, just a factor of what type of breed these animals are. Our maternal animals or our weight-faced sheep breeds, for example, will go through lactation and will connect with their offspring a bit more when we compare them to some of our black-faced breeds or terminal sire breeds. I also wanted to know what we should be doing with our, our lambs and kids, but also with our females as well. We want to really, when we're thinking about weaning, we need to think about this from the standpoint of one week out or one week prior. We want to sort out our females that we plan to wean. We're going to be removing those supplemental grains from the diet or those high energy inputs from the diet to really force a reduction in milk production. Uh, this is a really good place to use some of our first cut hay or our hay that is of really low quality. And this is where those hay tests really pay off in the end. It's recommended that we leave these uh, females on these poor quality roughage, roughage feed sources, allowing no grain until those udders dry up. And that's really gonna help uh, decrease any type of issues that we may have with uh, mastitis or any type of udder issues. And I know that we're gonna have a lot of discussion about that here in just a bit. And then another thing that we need to understand is we really want to separate the dams from the offspring and not vice versa. Uh, many times it's easy for us to take away those lambs and kids out of the barn from where they were with their mothers and take them to a clean location, a nice feed out pen. Uh, but really to reduce the stress on our offspring, our lambs and our kids, we want to remove the, the females uh, from that area itself. And the reason being is that those lambs and kids are really familiar with that environment in which they were born in and raised in. And that really helps in terms of reducing that weaning stress. I think it's also important that we understand the complexity of these animal stressors and, and why it's such a stressful time period. Changes certainly in nutrition, going from a liquid or a partial liquid diet completely to a, a, a solid feed intake, whether that be our grains or a mix of forages as well. We also need to think about the st social structure and how we're breaking that bond between the ewe and the lamb. And that's honestly one of the most strongest bonds that we have uh, developed in a young lamb's uh, lifetime. And as soon as we break that bond and we force co-mingling amongst, you know, conspecifics or even strangers in some cases when they're not uh, acclimated or used to one another, that can be a really stressful time period, especially when they're trying to determine a hierarchy of dominance. And then also environment. They're really unfamiliar with the environment. They don't know where the water is, for example, or how to eat uh, without mom. So stress can certainly result in physiological indicators. So, you know, deviations in our typical immune response. Uh, that's why we see a lot of issues in terms of animals getting sick during weaning just due to the physical stress. We can also see production indicators. We'll really see a reduction in growth rates as soon as weaning occurs. We may see some of our lambs and kids go off feed, but they will turn around. And then also there are certainly some behavioral indicators that we can use, uh, agitation, restlessness, and vocalizations being just a few. I also help with teaching the uh, welfare and behavior class at Ohio State here, and I specifically focus on, on small ruminant production. And we talk about the issues with weaning and the stereotypies and abnormal, abnormal behaviors that may occur of it. 
So these stereotypies that we're talking about are repetitive or unvarying or apparently functionless uh, behavioral patterns. Uh, for example, uh, bar biting, uh, slat and chain chewing, especially in our swine, uh, rattling or biting you know, inanimate objects within the pen. Uh, we do see uh, mouthing of air from our horses that are put into a stall too long. Uh, wool sucking or wool chewing uh, can also occur in sheep. And then also stargazing in some cases. So to kind of remedy some of those, those abnormal behaviors, you can see at our research unit up here at ORDC located in Worcester, Ohio, uh, we have put some plastic pieces on the back ends of our panels here to allow those lambs to kind of mouth that piece of plastic and spin it around in circles, to give them something to do. And then also we can see that there may be some issues with the wool puck, plicking, uh, plucking, sucking, chewing. Uh, and this sometimes is associated with a lack of available fiber or physically effective uh, fiber in the diet. So these are some things that we can implement on farm to attenuate these, uh, these abnormal behaviors, uh, implementing some of these toys, if you would, uh, to take their mind off of things and get rid of those behaviors that may be associated with weaning. So I thought as I was developing this presentation for you tonight, I thought it was really important to go through some weaning strategies as opposed from, you know, the old uh, method of just, you know, scooping up the lambs and the kids and, and putting them directly into a feedlot, taking them to a sale barn or on pasture or whatever your operation entails. So the first one that I want to talk about is presented here by Orger and others from 1998, and it's talking about progressive weaning. So they compared progressive weaning to just traditional weaning. And tonight, as we go through these um, different research projects, when I talk about traditional weaning, it's just the physical separation of the offspring from its dam, just as we would in our normal operations. But here in the case of progressive weaning, uh, this experiment took a look at some uh, mid-lactation mid -lactation use, and you can see that the time period was from three and a half weeks to up to 15 and a half weeks. And what they did is they progressively removed that lamb or, and progressively increased the amount of time that those lambs were separated from their ewes. So you can see, for example, at three and a half weeks of age, out of 24 hours of the day, two hours were separated from one another. And as we progress in age, we also progress in the time that they spend apart from one another. So uh, when we're taking a look at some of this data, I'm going to present some of the behavioral data, and then we'll also present the, uh, the economics or the growth uh, parameters that were associated with these weaning strategies. So the first that I want to take a look at here is the behavioral aspect of this progressive weaning. And what they were measuring here was high-pitched bleats, so bleats or sounds of extreme stress uh, of these animals. And we can associate that with uh, increased locomotion, increased restlessness, also an increase in heart rate, and also an increase in cortisol levels. So when we think about uh, evaluating our ewes, when we're talking about progressive weaning or sudden weaning, immediately removing the offspring from the dam, we can see that sudden weaning results in a lot more of these high-pitched bleats for our ewes. We can also see this translated uh, back to our lambs as well. When we compare progressive weaning to sudden weaning, we see this huge increase in the amount of stress being presented by these animals. However, there was no effect uh, when we took a look at uh, lamb weight gain uh, using these two different uh, management practices. But the one piece of information that I always question to my students when we talk about this progressive weaning is, are there any potential health issues that may arise from this? And in my opinion, there certainly could be, uh, especially if we're removing these animals for durations of time throughout the day, especially as we get towards that uh, later portion where they spend a significant amount of time away from uh, their dam and away from that milk supply. Because we know if they are are uh, single lambs, uh, we know that they can kind of gorge themselves on milk intake. We can also result in some issues with overeating, especially our clostridial diseases of C, uh, and, and have some uh, really ill effects associated with that. The next strategy I want to talk about is fence line weaning, and we're probably familiar with this in the cattle industry, and, and really uh, this is pretty simple. We're putting some type of physical barrier up, and as you can see in this example, they were using Katahdin sheep for this uh, in the Bax paper from 2015, uh, and this is going to be one, a physical barrier, but also a stimulated barrier as well since we have this electrified, and these lambs are just on the opposite side of the fence. They're removed from the milk supply of the ewe, uh, but they still have physical contact if they they want or if they dare try, but they are also able to see their mother. 
So again, thinking about the behavioral aspect of this, uh, as we take a look at vocalizations, the amount of walking, running, standing, and lying down, we see no differences between these uh, two treatments. So fence line weeding uh, did not you know, decrease the frequency or percentage of time spent vocalizing, uh, lying down, standing, or walking rapidly in this case. As we take a look at some of our production parameters, you can also see as we compare, for example, the end of the study body weight, our weaning average daily gain, our total gain found out uh, of these lambs out on pasture, we see that there are no differences between our treatment groups. So when we're considering fence line weaning, we can see that it's not any less stressful for our lambs, and it also really isn't beneficial in terms of overall growth. Uh, the consideration that I like to consider here is you've got to have a really nice fence in order to perform this, especially with sheep and goats, because they will find their way through a fence uh, if they really want to. Another piece of, of literature that I found really interesting was this thought of two-stage weaning. And this uh, Nonzorium paper from 2015, what they did, and although I know that this is a, is a doe, I wanted to provide a picture for a visual illustration for us, was they simply covered uh, the udder of that U in this specific paper uh, with a towel itself. So just blocked the ability of those lambs to be able to suckle from, from their dam. They could still touch them, sniff them, interact with them, just simply cut off that milk supply. Fly. Although there isn't any type of research that supports uh, this strategy, this is also very similar. Uh, this is called an easy wean ring strategy, and it seems to be quite popular over in the, in the UK. Uh, but nonetheless, this could also be a strategy implemented in this two-stage weaning process. Again, thinking about the behavioral aspects of, of this study here, we can see when we take a look at bleats per minute, and I should explain what our treatment groups are here. One and two are going to be our animals that were weaned within six weeks of age. Three and four are going to be weaning strategies that were performed in weeks 12. Groups one and three were our weaning strategies, which were considered traditional. So an immediate breaking of that ewe lamb bond, the lambs being removed from the situation. And then th two and four, so our even numbers, are going to be those that were our two-stage wean. When we take a look at our bleats per minute, you can see that we have differences across each of our treatment groups. Obviously, when we, we wean them early at six weeks of age and do it immediately, we see that there's an increase in bleats per minute. And then as we kind of transverse down through uh, these figures, we can see that it, the bleats per minute decrease based upon uh, the treatment that's implemented. So again, greatest number of bleats per minute were when they were removed immediately at six weeks of age. Eating and ruminating also kind of follow the same uh, parameters as well, but the one piece that I wanted to point out here was our, our two-stage weaning here in two and four. We saw increases in eating, or not necessarily increases, but uh, uh, positive rates of, of eating. The, the situation in which we see the lowest eating uh, behavior here uh, was when they were immediately weaned at one day of age. And then also we see those also reflect in our standing and walking behaviors. Obviously, if our animals are standing and walking more, they're more restless, they're more uncomfortable, they're going to be expending excess energy that isn't needed. But there's a different story uh, when we talk about uh, some of our body weight gains. And I should note that body weight and average daily gain was calculated at week 16. And uh, interestingly here, it kind of splits it between one and two and three and four. What's more interesting here is that actually one and two, which again were those lambs that were weaned early at six weeks of age, actually at that 16 week mark had greater body weights and average daily gains when we compare them to our later wean groups. And the paper attributes this really that to an increase in digestibility of digestible uh, energy and protein in those diets of those lambs supplied supplemental grains right after weaning. So if we give these animals a bit more time beyond the 16 weeks of age, perhaps these animals, once they're put on feed and acclimated to feed, compensatory gain may be able to take over and increase this gain. And the last piece I want to discuss was delayed weaning. And this is a project that I did during my master's career. And we'll kind of go through this really briefly. The first of uh, treatment that we implemented was a pasture control. Uh, all lambs in this study were weaned at 60 days of age. So weaned at 60 days of age, put out on pasture. Social facilitator, these lambs were weaned at 60 days of age, but there was a mature ewe that was non-related and non-lactating that was put into this group of, of lambs. There were three uh, ewes per replicate or three ewes per six lambs. And these adult ewes that were our social facilitators were in there, uh, just as we see in the beef feedlot system, to hopefully show those animals where and how to graze. 
Our third group going to be our U treatment. Our lambs were strictly put back out onto pasture and they remained with their dam for an additional uh, 60 days and were weaned at approximately 120 days of age. And then we also had this negative control where we put our lambs in the feedlot at 60 days of age, just as we would see here in the US. As we were taking a look at body weight, the two groups that I really wanna focus in on here is our ewes and our feedlot controls. You can see that over this 56 day grazing period, those lambs that remained with their ewes or that were delayed weaned resulted with the greatest body weight at the conclusion of the 56 day grazing period. This was even greater than our feedlot controls, which may not be um, something that we really think about. And then obviously these were also much lower than our other lambs that were weaned at 60 days of age and placed out on pasture. So this information here tells us that uh, the social facilitator aspect may not work as well as what we anticipated it doing so. As we take a look at average daily gain, we see the same uh, story as we've seen previously. Those lambs that remained with their ewes had a greater average daily gain. The feedlot control group were somewhere intermediate. And then also our lambs that were out on pasture, just weaned out to pasture, had our lowest average daily gains. The other piece of the puzzle people always ask, well, how does this translate to overall production uh, of these lambs once they're weaned and once they're within our systems? And this is a really nice table that shows us what happens to them during that finishing phase. What I do want to point out here is uh, total dry matter intake. Obviously, those lambs uh, that were in the feedlot for an additional 60 days or 56 days are going to have our greatest um, you know, intake of total feed. And you can see that actually that our lowest group is here uh, with our lambs that remain with their, with their dams. Also, we need to consider what our total days in the feedlot were. Now, we need to take up off that 56 days for that original 56 days of that trial um, uh, that those lambs were in the feedlot prior to our pasture group lambs. And when we take that 56 days away, when we think about total days in this finishing feedlot phase, we can see that those lambs that remained with their dams or were put into the feedlot actually finished at the same day of age. And this is huge because this shows us that one, delayed weaning actually results in a decreased need for feedstuffs and also increases the overall efficiency of your operation as these lambs finished at the same day of age when we compare them to our feedlot control group lambs. So my most followed up question to that information is always, what is the effect of delayed weaning on the U? Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have any of that data published because we couldn't make any comparisons, but we can report that all the U's that were on that project were successfully rebred for the following year. They did not fall out of the production scheme and they didn't have any issues with uh, mastitis or any type of utter issues due to prolonged nursing. So that also brings up the question of overall U milk yield. Although we don't have a really good idea in terms of our commercial production, production uh, here this paper from 2002 shows us that uh, based upon uh, some commercial use that we're taking a look at, and they only went to 63 days of age uh, on those, those lambs and ewes, but we can still see that there is a fair amount of milk being produced during this time period. As we consider some of our dairy breeds or more maternal breeds that may have a larger or longer lactation curve, we can see that Ruse and others from 2000 also monitored the, uh, the effects of lactation or the time period of lactation on these ewes. And we can see even at 170 days of age, uh, these ewes again are supplying enough milk. Um, when we think about this ewe milk yield, regardless of the amount of milk being produced, it's the fact that those lambs have access to extremely highly digestible uh, feedstuffs when we compare them especially to some of our other feedstuffs in terms of forages. So again, regardless of, of the amount of milk perhaps uh, available during that time or during that nursing bout, any of it uh, at that time point is important and beneficial. So now that we've went through some of our weaning strategies, what do we do after we wean? And of course, we need to think about sorting. Are we going to be separating our males from our females? Are we going to be shipping them off as feeders? Are we going to retain them to finish them out? Uh, do we have females or males that we want to retain as, as replacements uh, as well? And then obviously those ewes and our does uh, that had produced our offspring are going to go into a, a maintenance diet of lower quality. So, you know, once sorted, what, what's next? We need to think about our housing and not really a big discussion point of tonight, but I want us to really have this in the back of our mind, thinking about the importance of, of ventilation and how we're providing that for our animals in what type of setting that we may have them in. And then also, are you going to have uh, provide them with outdoor access? Does that really align with the ideals of the markets that you're trying to appease or market into? 
certainly diets and rations. We talked uh, extensively about those during our last section, and I'm going to touch on those briefly here just in a moment. But think about fiber source and what are resources that are available. And then finally, we'll kind of wrap up about, you know, thinking about those markets of interest, grass-fed versus grain-fed lamb. So just quickly, I wanted to compare a couple experiments that took a look at comparing a couple different diets. This first one from Borton and others in 2005 was conducted here at Ohio State, and the treatments are pretty simple. And for the sake of time, we'll just talk about the treatments. Uh, the first treatment was those lambs that were grazed on perennial ryegrass. That's just describing the diet that they were provided. And then the second ones were put into a feedlot and they were fed this high concentrate diet. And the concentrate diet is listed here below. What I want to take a look at here is overall finishing performance of, of all of these lambs. And we can see that, if, especially if we want to take a look at days on feed, obviously those that were fed a high concentrate diet finished a lot earlier when we compare them to our grazing lambs. And then also they have an average daily gain that's almost three times greater than that found in our ryegrass pastures. Now, many of you may be thinking that makes a lot of sense. And why is he discussing this with us this evening? I really wanted to hit on this because we need to think about what are the rations that we need to be providing to our animals to meet our market demands. Are we trying to feed out animals quickly to meet a market relatively soon? Do we want to kind of background these animals and hold on to them, grow them in terms of frame and size, and then market them at a later date? Or are we also wanting to grow some of our replacements a bit slower um, to ensure that they have longevity within the flock? So these are some of the things that we need to think about. The second one is also here from Ohio State by Jabork and others from 2017. And what these authors did is they took a look at three different treatments. They took a look at ad libitum whole shell corn ration, ad libitum alfalfa pellet ration, and then also a limit fed whole shell corn ration. And all these rations had uh, a supplement pellet that was associated with it that provided uh, the recommended levels of minerals, vitamins, and protein needed for these animals. And then this limit fed ration was fed at 80% or 85% 80 of that ad libitum fed diet. What I want to take a look at here is really that average daily gain, dry matter intake. Obviously, we see that uh, those that were on the ad libitum whole shell corn diet, high energy diet, had the greatest average daily gain. When we take a look at this dry matter intake, we see that uh, those on the alpha alpha pellets or those forage diets had a greater uh, dry matter intake. Days on feed, obviously, our quickest was those that were ad libitum access. Uh, to our whole shelled corn. Uh, but the other interesting piece of the puzzle is taking a look at this gain to feed and feed of gain, price of feed to gain. And we can kind of see here that obviously um, our least efficient diet and most costly diet is going to be that that's revolving around forages and not necessarily forages, it's these alfalfa pellets. And due to their processing, they do cost a bit more, but they also are a lot inefficient. And then also thinking about, you know, do we want to conserve some of our feed, especially that's important nowadays with our corn prices being 550 plus a bushel. So we can kind of see that there's no differences in terms of gain to feed between our two uh, whole shell corn uh, rations. And then there is a slight improvement in terms of cost of feed to gain when we take a look at our ad lib compared to our limit fed diet. And the other piece of the puzzle that I think it's important is taking a look at does that affect the overall composition of that carcass that we're producing. Uh, you can see that our heavier carcasses do come from those uh, whole shelled corn diets as we compare them to some of our uh, forage fed diets. And again, that's due to an increase in dressing percentage. Uh, the reduction in dressing percentage here with our forage based diet is probably a result of the increase uh, visceral organ mass required for uh, just fiber digestion in general. And we can also see that uh, although it may have been a bit more, a bit less efficient in terms of overall efficiency of the system, we do see that these uh, forage fed diets resulted in less back fat. So that's good in terms of reducing waste that's going to be thrown away, or even in terms of reducing the amount of fat that we may see on some of our replacement females. However, at the end of the day, when we really base the value of our carcasses on this boneless cut trimmed retail cuts, we see that there were no differences between our treatments. So really kind of wrap up things, I think we need to find these breeds that meet the demand of the market that we're into. Uh, I know we've got visitors with us from all over the nation. Thinking about the Eastern US market, we're looking for some of those early maturing breeds. So those lambs that are, have the ability to, to uh, appear finished or have enough flesh to them at that 60, 80 pound 
um, live weight merit to really appease some of those ethnic markets. Really uh, nice roaster lambs for, for those, those feeder lambs for those ethnic markets that really drive our industry here in the eastern U.S. And then also, you know, land availability. Are we able to have um, 50 ewes out on pasture or are we going to put 50 ewes with uh, 100 lambs out on pasture? Uh, with our limited uh, land availability, that just may not get it with all those sheep and we want to conserve our pastures for our maintenance diets of our animals. And then also thinking about our Western U.S. land production, a lot of times those are some of our framier breeds. They're later maturing. Uh, they have that larger frame to them. And also thinking about uh, some of the differences in their markets that they're looking for. Um, and then goats, you know, where do goats fit into this? And I think uh, regardless of, of the production system that you're in, goats are always in a high demand currently in the U.S., uh, regardless of their, their background in terms of dairy or, or goat or um, uh, meat breed behind that genetic profile of those animals. And maybe Tim can uh, hit on that a bit here. So what are some of these uh, marketing opportunities more specifically for us here in the Eastern US? I, I really like this quote here from Tim Bar uh, Barmet, the sheep and goat manager over at the New Holland Auctions in Pennsylvania. He made this statement on April 7th of 2017, and I think it still holds pretty true today that 99 pound lambs are worth the same price as a 140 pound lamb. Uh, really read that again, a 99 pound lamb. So a lamb that is weighing uh, you know, 41 pounds less than that heavier lamb was valued at the same price. I think given the, um, the feed costs in our industry right now, it'd be a no brainer to get rid of these animals at an earlier weight. So why do we see some of these uh, earlier premiums or price differentials? It's a lightweight, it's a high lean to fat ratio. Uh, more than likely those lambs have a lesser uh, amount of fat on them and that's really desirable, especially for our American consumers who aren't really a fan of that lamby taste or flavor. And then also these unblemished or unaltered lambs are going to get that price differential as well. So really when it comes down to it, we need to think about in the East, who are, who are our biggest consumers? And I think, um, uh, Melanie Barkley from uh, Penn, Penn State University. She's an extension educator. She does a really nice job of, of an article that I recently posted on the OSU Sheep Team webpage where she took a look at the, the benefits of Eastern market um, marketing of lambs and goats uh, here thinking about non-traditional markets especially for those that are coming up for us here, thinking about Passover, our Easter's, and our time periods of feasting for some of our religious groups. Really, March 27th down to May 12th and 13th are going to be some of the biggest time periods in which our small ruminant products are going to be demanded in the marketplace. And I think as producers, we need to really uh, be keen and pay attention to not only the ones that I've got highlighted here, but all of them throughout the year that really base a lot of their um, celebrations based upon our small ruminant products. If we're able to follow this uh, calendar, and I know um, a lot of these dates will vary within a month or even across the year, it can be challenging to meet the demands of these markets. But if you're able to have flexibility within your operation to kind of chase some of these markets, it's certainly well worth it. And Tim will explain that here in just a bit as well. But with that being said, regardless, I think that, that uh, the important piece of, of tonight's discussion is that there is a demand for the products that we are producing, especially here from 2017. I know it's a bit dated, but you can see there's a huge spike in the amount of total lamb being requested. And this is actually uh, April 16th. I looked that up just before our discussion here, and that was Easter Day. Uh, during 2017. So we see a huge uh, demand for lamb here during Easter. And then we also see this uptick during that Christmas time period. So uh, although we used to have, uh, you know, issues in the past with getting some of our products marketed efficiently and quickly, we can see that there is beginning to have a huge demand uh, for our products. And that's exciting for us as we get into this. The last piece that I wanted to kind of sign off with is thinking about some of these marketing tips to help you achieve a greater uh, premium for your animals at the sale barn. Uh, the first of which is sell these animals prior to the holidays. Uh, again, that, um, that calendar that I've provided is available online through Penn State as well as our OSU sheep team. And we accredit Penn State and thank them for providing that for us. But think about those holidays in which you're trying to achieve and get those premium markets at. One thing that we do want to note is that you need to be marketing those animals two to three weeks prior to that holiday. Uh, you can't expect to get that premium right on the week of that holiday because buyers are looking to fulfill their quota and they need to do that a couple weeks prior to. 
And we also want to ensure that we're not flooding the market. So take a look at the uh, the average rolling um, you know reports of that market that you may be interested in going to, and see where some of those peak prices are, and see when some of those low prices are. Engage when would be most appropriate for you to be able to sell your animals, because the last thing you want to do is have uh, have that market be flooded and really not get prey to premium for your product. If you're able to do so, lot and mark your sale animals together, consistency sales. Obviously, if you've got 50 ewes and you're able to make uh, 100 lambs and you can get that lambing done in, in one uh, estrus cycle or in a 17-day window, uh, that's the benefit of you. And this also encourages us to improve our RAM and our buck battery at home because that's able to, um, if we have good, reliable data on our RAMs and we know the or have an indication of uh, what type of animals or offspring these animals are going to be able to produce, we can help improve the consistency of our lots being sold. Obviously, a no-brainer is keeping your animals clean, and this is where clean bedding really pays off. I know that some of our bedding sources, uh, especially straw here in Ohio and southern Ohio, uh, can reach upwards of $8 to $10 for a small square bale, but uh, that investment is well worth it in the end as this, these clean animals do sell. Unaltered or unblemished animals, this is obviously going to, one, increase the weight of your animals because you remain, allow those rams to remain intact. Uh, so we have the weight of the scrotum and the testicles, but also the testosterone of that animal, allowing that animal to increase growth rates and uh, keep that tail on them as well. This will certainly improve the marketability of your animals because there are some uh, religious sects that would uh, actually prefer animals that are unaltered. And then if you're able and comfortable to do so, offer some deals and services on farm to improve the marketability of your stock. Uh, so with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, I appreciate your attention with the, the discussion this evening, and I'm happy to take a few questions while Tim gets his video ready for the next presentation. Brady, thank you for sharing that presentation with us. We did have one comment that you were going pretty fast through the charts and some people would probably like to review those later on for a closer look. And we will be happy to make those recordings available to you as soon as they process from the webinar and we're able to get those posted in a shared location. We will send that out to all the registered guests from tonight so that you can uh, go through those at your own pace or reference anything that you'd like to see again. Or if you were joining us just a few minutes past seven, You'll be able to catch up on that little bit that you may have missed. So um, we will make that available to you when it is ready. We don't have any pending questions in Q&A right now, but as a reminder for all of our participants, you can type questions for the speakers in the Q&A box or use the chat box to converse with uh, any of the participants tonight. So thank you and we'll go ahead and move on to Tim's presentation here. Tim is going to give us a market update with some uh, recent market report and expectations of what we'll see. Tim? Hello, Tim Barnes here, uh, Marion County Extension educator, helping out tonight with uh, the sheep webinar here, talk uh, some about the land markets. And I, I guess the best way to start off is just say, wow. Uh, you know, the prices have just been tremendously good, uh, seem each week. Of course, as we're into the, as we're into the religious holidays, uh, and traditionally this is a time of the year where we do have a, a little higher premium in the market. So, uh, yes, enjoy that, but, uh, it, it's really interesting. Um, we were really resilient, uh, through the, the COVID last year. Uh, we dipped down there maybe uh, one week in, in, in March. Uh, as you compare us to the other protein sources, we held up extremely well. The markets came back really within a week or so. Uh, you know, as more people ate at home, uh, you know, families tried lamb and they enjoyed it. And uh, they also really seemed to enjoy the non-traditional cuts, the more the ground product than the cube product. Uh, but again, they couldn't go to the restaurants, but they ate lamb, and that sure is helping us through this uh, time. Uh, demand for Ohio lambs, of course, part of that's our location, which we're, we're part of that. We know that we're close to the 
population centers on the East Coast. That uh, surely is helping us. But uh, the roasters are the 60 pound lambs now, $3. And, and again, you'll, you'll hear people talk about, you know, almost $4 in some of these sales. If you look at the charts, basically that's uh, pretty much close to a dollar higher than 12 months ago and, and uh, close to a dollar over the five year average. And uh, we're seeing an additional uh, change a little bit in the lamb weights. There is more of a premium for the lighter lambs. Uh, you know, these non-traditional markets are, are helping us by increasing that a little bit. And when I say the traditional markets, uh, that is racks, uh, loins and legs. Um, you know, those tend to go a little more for the roaster, uh, restaurant trade, but uh, our big retail, a part of retail also, but through the last year, uh, it has you know, gone over more towards ground lamb and the cube product. <clears throat> As you look at this chart and uh, throughout today, uh, you know, most of the data, I think all the data I show here is uh, from United Producers here and uh, specifically their Mount Vernon uh, collection point. But here over the last five years, you see the, the chart for the yearly averages uh, for the 60 pound or what they call uh, the roaster lambs. And uh, really uh, that 304 for 2021 just does represent January and February. Uh, but again, uh, our, our location is extremely important here. Uh, it's a pretty consistent market if you drop out the 21 and look at the rest of them, a slight dip there in 19. Uh, but again, uh, these 60 pound lambs over the last five years have been extremely profitable and uh, very financially positive for most sheep operations. <clears throat> market weights are getting lighter. Um, this is USDA's numbers. As you look at the 65 pound lambs and down, uh, you know, they're 12% more of those are sold. And I think you add that to these up to the, 80, under the 84 pound lambs, uh, you know, that represents 30%, 36% of the market, uh, you know, has changed. Uh, we see a reduction as we look at these bigger carcasses that need a little more fabrication. Uh, but it, it's interesting the way this kind of has changed. Chart here shows uh, five-year averages, and I pulled out the 131 pound and, uh, and bigger lambs and the roasters. I did break out the hair lambs and also the meat goats just for comparison purpose. As you can see, uh, the, the 2020 is on the left in all of those, and uh, 2016 ended up being the, the chart, the brown chart on the right. You can see in the, in the big lambs, just pretty consistent. We hang in that $150, a hundred range. Uh, you know, over the last five years, you can see the high there is 161.82, the low 150, but uh, just pretty similar. Roasters uh, popped up a little higher this year. Last year, they were a, a tick lower. And again, um, uh, you know, no real reason for that. Demand probably drives this as much as anything. Uh, but you can see a pretty consistent price like we showed on the earlier slide for the roasters. Hair lambs, um, a little uh, discount for them in the Ohio market, but still uh, very, very uh, positive numbers there. Meat goats have been just, you know, really hot for the last five years. You see this chart, they really show that. You look at the high of being last year, the 273. Uh, and again, but they're, they're considerably higher. Uh, again, remember a goat at sale weight is uh, total pounds is a little lighter animal than we would compare to, uh, to the sheep in the same situation. <clears throat> Next chart is uh, I, I wanted to do a little comparison or at least to get you to think a little bit about uh, the big lambs versus uh, the, the smaller lambs and just the price difference you see. Uh, and this was just for last year, January through December, but you can see the, the, the discount of, as the lambs got bigger. And I guess a, as a, a lamb feeder and a lamb producer, you want to make sure that that discount, you know, uh, covers your costs of production. And with feed costs being considerably higher this year with $5 corn uh, and uh, $400 soybean meal, you know, you don't want to go to a lot of work and a lot of expense and uh, actually ended up netting less profit dollars 
than you could just selling the lambs at a lighter weight. Uh, this chart is for the big lambs. This is for the last five years. Uh, you can see the high was in 2017, kind of in that late summer, uh, before a lot of the, the big lambs uh, really hit the market. It was 217, a little over that. The low then was last year in that 120. And, and if you look at that chart and go back and analyze it, uh, you remember that was kind of in the time frame when there was a lot of discussion and the packing plants out west closed down. A lot of indecision on what was going to happen and then a couple of plants are, are in the process of reopening and maybe have reopened now uh, give a little more stability to the market but it, it, you know as you look at the differences and the movement through the years uh, pretty predictable you know in the way our markets move uh, we have a bounce up this time of year in the ethnic markets and uh, religious holidays and then as the supply of those bigger lambs begin to hit the market in early and late fall uh, a little bit of depression in, in price. Just threw this slide in again to, to talk about the, you know, the GOAT, uh, the term, you know, the, the market's been on fire. Uh, and again, realize there's no traditional meat system for goats, no processing uh, packer, uh, processing plants, and no really designated uh, large scale packer. It's basically a, a primarily an ethnic demand. Uh, again, like we talked there a little bit earlier, the goat will be a, a little lighter weight. And so the extra price compared to a lamb then of a little heavier lamb, a little lower price, actually dollars spent for that protein source of goat versus lamb ends up being extremely uh, similar. A big part of our, our market in um, is the imports. And again, the imports that come in here, uh, basically the one and two would be Australia and New Zealand, where they come from. And they can be and are considerably cheaper uh, than what we produce domestically. Uh, again, uh, the chilled, the frozen, uh, pro not as much fresh product coming in. Uh, but again, uh, they, they are an important part to meet the demand we have. Uh, it, it is important. And why is it important? Number one, as we look at the numbers from 2020, the lamb crop was down 1%. Uh, lamb slaughter was down 1%. Um, total numbers then obviously were down. Uh, like we mentioned, we did have the, the questions of the slaughter facilities and the infrastructure. Um, so uh, to meet the demand of the American public, uh, imports are very important to us. Um, as you look at this chart, it represents from 06 to, uh, to, well, this year or the beginning of this year, but just a pretty steady increase. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, so it's pretty much uh, consistent when you look at it on a monthly basis, about 20,000 uh, pounds of imported product, 20, 25,000 uh, each month. And uh, that helps us uh, to meet the demand that we cannot meet with our internal production. What's ahead for 21? Uh, high U numbers remain steady, and that's you know, we're roughly in that 123 to 25,000 uh, head range. Uh, the regional markets uh, continue to show demand for lamb, and uh, again through this COVID. Uh, project we've been through that's extremely positive. We're lucky to be here where we are and located. Uh, and hopefully the, the families that have tasted lamb and tried lamb through this at-home experience will compete, uh, continue to eat that product as we get back and start traveling more and more. Uh, the smaller carcasses, uh, you know, I think they're here to stay. Part of that is the popularity of some of our hair breeds, the Dorkers and Katahdins. Uh, probably just can't carry as much uh, massive weight as some of our black face breeds. I, and I, I think they will dictate more and more of the type of sheep we raise and the size of carcasses that uh, will be available. Restaurant trades, uh, we're hearing now as we right here in the, towards the end of March, uh, you know, more and more of these uh, restrictions are being lifted. We're gonna get back to eating the traditional a restaurant trade will come back for the racks, the loins, uh, and the legs. Um, you know, is this a time uh, 
to consider expansion. Uh, obviously, uh, we're working on redoing the high sheep budget uh, for production, but uh, quickly look into numbers, if you can realistic pencil in uh, some of these, maybe not at this upper level that we're currently at uh, right today, but if you have a realistic approach and look at the last five years, uh, obviously I think there are dollars out there uh, to be pocketed by uh, adding sheep or goats as, a, as an enterprise for your farming operation. So if you have additional questions, we'd be glad to answer them. And thank you for putting together that recorded presentation. We really appreciate your efforts to gather regional market reports and and also in the chat. Um, just regarding the way that our, our markets are reported, it can be difficult for people to translate that on farm into dollars per animal. And um, there's a lot of information out there to sift through. So again, as, as we stated, we do have these recorded and we will make them available so that you can pause the charts at any time in the recording. And also uh, there's a lot more regional information available out there, depending on which part of the country you're joining us from, that may give you a better picture of what's happening in the markets in your local community as well. One of the questions that we have in Q&A goes uh, partially back to Brady's presentation, but also applies here, Tim, with your presentation. Um, and I'm gonna mark that answer live now so that hopefully uh, everyone can see it. The question comes from Nicole and um, she's directed it for Brady that all of this is quite new to me. So forgive me if I'm asking an obvious question. You mentioned that on-farm services and products could be a good way to market lamb. What would that look like? Does lamb have to be USDA butchered or can it be done on farm and sold directly? I think together we can answer that question for anyone who may be wondering the same thing. Brady, do you wanna go ahead and start with an answer for that? Sure. So to address your question, what, what do these on-farm services uh, look like? So an example that I can that I can think of is if you have uh, some folks that are interested in, in acquiring a small roaster lamb uh, for a celebration that they may be having, uh, they don't want it taken anywhere and they want to do perhaps a religious or a ritual slaughter right there on farm. Uh, if you feel comfortable and have the ability to, you know, slaughter that animal on farm and allow them to do some of those processes right there on your farm, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, as you begin to connect with some of those, those groups and those people interested in, in doing that, uh, the greatest uh, part of that or greatest way that you can spread your, your business is by word of mouth. They'll tell those that, that they interact with and tell them, you know, how well you treated them and the services that you're able to, to provide. So that's on an individual need uh, basis. Um, also, does lamb have to be USDA butchered? No, um, lamb does not have to be USDA butchered, but in order for you to sell retail or sell to a provider, uh, it does have to be inspected. Uh, USDA inspected is required if you're going across state lines. So if I have lamb that I'm trying to sell our market and I sell it to anybody here in the state of Ohio, it has to be Ohio inspected. But if I have some people that uh, come across from West Virginia, since I'm 17 miles from the border, and they want to purchase some of our lamb products, at that point, I have to be USDA certified. So, uh, and then your final question, uh, or can it be done on farm and sold directly? So you yourself can harvest and process a lamb for your own consumption, uh, but you're not able to harvest and um, package that lamb and then it be sold as a retail product because it hasn't gone through the appropriate um, inspection channels. Brady, great answer. Do we have any additional things um, to add, Guy? No, I think Brady covered that very well. You know, yeah, it's, uh, and again, people need to realize now, you know, this past 12 months, all the private slaughter facilities here in the state of Ohio just are booked way out. So you got to think way ahead if you're even wanting to plan to go to a state inspected or a USDA inspection plant to make sure there's time frame there if you're thinking about merchandising product. Just, you know, be sure to check your state's um, guidelines on, on all of that if, 
for on-farm slaughter that, you know, what we shared were Ohio's, but I know there's lots of different states that have a very differing uh, guidelines as well. So if, before you go doing anything, uh, be sure to check your own state's guidelines. Absolutely. Something to note as well is that if you are going to be selling um, meat products, whether that's freezer meats, retail meats, um, whatever unit you are selling it in needs to be labeled. Each packet that you sell has to have the inspection label on it, a unit of weight and a description of the contents, as well as your address as the seller of that product. So um, there are guidelines for this listed in each state's um, laws pertaining to meat sales in a slaughter. So as we stated, check with your state, but nationally the USDA inspection label is required if you're selling across state lines. Um, not required for in-state sales, but absolutely required for across um, state lines. And then if you're thinking about marketing, say at farmer's markets locally, you will need to check with your local health department on rules for selling meats at markets. Typically, you will, you will need some type of a mobile license to sell, and that will require inspection of your um, items so that they know you're keeping everything at the appropriate temperature in your selling location. So if you're looking into direct marketing or selling in a retail space, make sure you're communicating with all the levels there, your local health department, your state guidelines, and then national guidelines if you're crossing state lines. We have a lot of questions now coming in in the Q&A regarding this discussion. And we also have some nice discussion in the chat box as well. We've also been doing a couple polls uh, since this discussion does vary a bit regionally. So we do have quite a mix of different states, but everyone joining us tonight is from the United States. Let's look at a couple more of those questions. Um, what would be a good source for information on progressive weaning? Brady, I see you've marked that question to answer live. Yeah, so that's an interesting question, Lori, and I had a, a bit of difficulty as I was uh, taking a look online to find some scientific uh, based literature. So uh, at the current moment, I, I don't have a better answer for you, except for the information that I provided. Uh, the, the information that they showed didn't show any type of benefit in terms of lamb growth or weight gain, or, um, but there was some uh, benefit in terms of uh, decreasing some of those stress associated uh, with weaning stress. So if you'd like, uh, feel free to follow up with me, shoot me an email, and uh, I'll continue to work on that uh, subject with you because I myself are interested to see if we can find a bit more information on what other uh, progressive weaning management strategies we could find. And I'm going to punch my, um, my email address there in the chat box. Thank you. While we do another poll here, just to see what our concentration of uh, lamb and goat producers is tonight. Let's address this, let's, question, let's do this question from Denise and then we'll do this next one from Gretchen. Denise asks, how limited are processing facilities for sheep and goats in Ohio? I know beef processing facilities are super limited in my area in Ohio. Denise, most of the, the processors that I know that do beef will also do sheep and goats. Um, typically, Lamb, beef, goats, they're typically lumped into the same category for slaughter, depending on the processor's uh, preference. But then poultry and rabbits, they are a separate um, certification for, for processing. But typically, if they do beef, they will also do lamb and goat. Um, but some processors have a preference, and you can typically find that out simply by calling them or checking their website. Any other thoughts? Sadly, here in Central Ohio, we uh, this past, I guess, two years ago, we we did lose another uh, processing facility um, that went. They they're still functioning. They just are no longer taking sheep and goats. So um, it's it's getting hard to find those in general. Um, but the ones that we do have, just like just like you mentioned, are are full. Uh, and and like Christine said, if, if they're full, they're kind of full. They're lumping those all those uh, spots together, and it's. It has got um, somewhat out of hand. <laughs> Once you find a processor that you really like to work with, make sure you're maintaining a good relationship with them because it, it is very hard to find appointments um, and likely going to continue to be that way for, for some time. 
Um, it is something that we're trying to work on within the state of Ohio, but when you're involved with so many um, safety regulations, both for employees and the consumer, it, it is slow going. Um, let's, let's address this last question in the Q&A for now from Gretchen. And she asks, how do you pick which lambs to sell for slaughter? Which ones that you would call or ones that are great meat character? This is a wool person asking the question. We're going to get into this in the next presentation, aren't we? Yes, so uh, the next presentation, um, we are gonna talk about that, but uh, I guess in, in general, is your question more about ones you would call or ones that you're trying to sell for meat reasons, I guess, like actual like meat consumption, I guess would be a, a, a little bit more of what we need to that question. Yeah, I think the answer to this question depends a lot on your specific uh, system and who you're selling to, which, which product is most valuable to you, which is something we're going to be talking about through our culling discussions, which are about to follow. And uh, Gretchen follows up and it says, I guess uh, ones I would call, I want to keep them all. Okay, so we're gonna talk about calling um, here. Um, I think that's a great segue and transition into our presentation. It sure is. So Jackie <laughs> and Tim are going to uh, start our discussion on calling by giving us a perspective of purebred operations and the criteria that um, those producers tend to follow, sometimes are a little bit more forgiving of issues that on the commercial side uh, may not be. And so we're going to give a couple presentations in regard to calling uh, from a couple different perspectives. So this is the perfect time to transition. And uh, Jackie and Tim, we will turn it over to you. Okay. Are you seeing the um, slideshow or the slide deck? I see PowerPoint with the slides um, open. I still see you're in PowerPoint at this time on my screen. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I never know which screen it's gonna go to. How about now? Yes. Yes. Good. Yay. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Uh, so Tim and I are going to um, talk a little bit about purebred operations. And uh, the more we think about it, the more we can put the word show in there. Um, more specifically, you know, trying to, to enhance or better uh, a breed or a, a reason for doing this. So why, why, why do we even need to call? So I think that's kind of getting at the question that we just had of, you know, I, I kind of want to keep them all. However, uh, we have to think about what we need here. Um, so eventually we need to remove those old genetics so we can shorten that generation interval. Tim, do you wanna talk about what a generation interval is? Well, genera generation interval is, you know, how quick uh, you can get basically your new, genetic, new genetics into the point that it's reproducing. Uh, pretty commonly done now in, uh, in the purebred and in the show, show flocks, uh, you know, they breed their ewe lambs. Now they breed them a little later as they get a little more mature uh, size to them, but uh, you're basically getting those ewes, your newest genetics into production a year quicker where uh, some other, you know, uh, in the past we've tended to wait and maybe breed our yearling ewes. So it's, uh, it's just making this happen using a ram lamb and a ewe lamb, uh, you just the generation interval you know, gets that new genetics into your flock and producing uh, quicker. So in this purebred or, or show industry world, you know, we're, we're always breeding for a reason. We're making these specific selections for a reason, uh, whether, whether that be uh, size or, or dollars or, or whatever it is. So we want to try and shorten that generation time that, so we can bring those new genetics in so that we can make that change quicker. Another reason that we would call would be facilities. Um, and maybe, and maybe that was kind of getting at the question that we had as well. Is uh, uh, I want to keep them all, but I, I don't have room to fit them. So you got to kind of think about uh, what can actually fit physically in your facilities that you have. Uh, you need to worry about labor. Uh, Tim says there's not enough hours in the day. Um, 
You think about your labor <laughs> concerns that you have. My point being, yeah, the average size of the flock, uh, you know, in Ohio is roughly 25, 30 ewes. So obviously you can't have a full-time shepherd. So and everybody has at least one or two uh, jobs. And, uh, you know, it's just, uh, especially lambing time, this time of year, busy times of the year, there just seems like there's not enough hours in a day. And if you don't watch it, you can expand your U base very easily from year to year and uh, go from 30 to 40 pretty quick. But uh, yeah, just uh, make sure you don't overwork your family, I guess. So why don't you go ahead and take the, uh, the finance part as well. And, and again, small flocks and especially in the pur purebred circles, uh, you know, it uh, profit loss sometimes uh, doesn't get em emphasized quite as much as we see on the commercial side. Uh, but, uh, but it is the experience, I, I think, a lot of people are, are working with their family together to, to produce an animal that then they can participate and sell offspring or show. And, uh, you know, how do you value that? Uh, it, uh, it's, uh, you know, sometimes uh, you just don't uh, get quite the, uh, the profit level in dollars and cents you might like, but it has a tremendous value in your quality of life. You want me to take this slide, right? Oh, yes, Tim, please do. <laughs> this slide actually comes from uh, Warwick uh, University in England, and it, it deals a little more with the profit side. Uh, as you look at that, basically the, the blue graph on the, on the very left in each of those three scenarios is a, is a, a ewe that lambs once, and then uh, the green one on the right is a ewe that has lambed five times. And basically, the, the three main reasons we get rid of animals, you're either going to call them, or they're going to be open or barren, or they're going to die. And so basically, what this graph shows, economically, if, if you call a ewe after she lambs once, you gain some value, because she probably did at least produce one or two lambs that give you some positive return. But if that ewe, after one, you know, she doesn't breed that first time, it just becomes her call value. And then if you, she actually dies before she lambs, you use the call, you lose the call value, you lose the profit level, and you, then you have those additional opportunity costs there. And then on the right, the older ewes that have lambed five times, if you end up calling them, it may be for what we were talking about, you want new genetics to come in that are more productive, but she's been good to you, actually giving you gross margin dollars for five years. If you decide, I mean, if she becomes barren in that fifth year, she still has produced for you and given you a profit margin for four years, and then you still have the call value. And then like all of them, if, if in that fifth year she does uh, you know, die, uh, she still has some economic input to your operation over the past few years. So some different methods of calling that we're going to get into. Um, the first one is tandem. Um, so that's when we're uh, going to be uh, selecting on a single trait to a certain level, and then we're going to also move on to the next trait. So this could be, uh, for instance, if we're going to strictly look at birth weight, and then we're going to call to a certain level, and then after that, we're going to look at maybe weaning weight. Um, so it's actually multiple traits happening at the same time. Um, independent culling, so that's a single trait only. So uh, one example of that is, you know, we could just look at the gross dollars produced per U per year. And then also there's some selection indexes out there that are EVBs. So these are some methods that we're, uh, that we've, that we've kind of gathered together. And then now we're going to kind of move on to some of those reasons, like why are we calling? So, um, these would be maybe some of those traits that we talked about for tandem or independent or, or even EVB. So we're gonna go through each of these tonight. Uh, we're gonna go through some uh, management reasons to call, some genetic concerns, uh, production levels, age, and then also we're gonna talk about some disease resistance. So when we talk about management reasons, we've kind of broke it out. Uh, the first one we're gonna talk about is a, a physicals, actual physicals of the U. Uh, some, one of these could be chronic foot problems, right? So you can see here, this, this poor little goat or sheep has uh, some pretty nasty foot rot. Um, there's U's on, on your grounds that will have chronic foot problems year, time after time and again. Uh, and you know those are ones that we need to kind of keep an eye on. 
Tim kind of talked about barren use already or use that have been open. Uh, mothering ability, utter performance. So we've got a few different things under here that we're talking about. You know, is, is that utter sound? Does she produce enough milk? Um, does she have secondary teats? And what is that teat shape? Um, is it still in a, in a, in a functioning uh, capacity for those lambs to nurse on? Uh, I'm gonna jump back up to the secondary teats here real quick. We, uh, we raised Tunis, which are the red lambs here that you can see in my background. And as a, as a whole, the breed does have lots of secondary teats. And uh, these can be small non-issues, but they also can be very uh, large teats that the lambs get confused and, and nurse on those instead. So uh, those, obviously we talked about lambs need colostrum and we need that, uh, that really uh, high caloric intake at those when they're young. So uh, having those secondary teats to confuse them is, is not helpful at all. Um, Jumping back to the, to the physical reasons, a body condition score as well as another reason that we could have for calling, and then entropy and eyelids. Uh, entropy and eyelids uh, actually will probably come back up on genetics as well. And I know we talked about it in the very first session, but that's when that eyelid uh, actually rolls in. So think of it if your eyelashes were kind of rolled into the inside and um, it's, really, it, it's really irritating for that eye and can cause lots of other problems as well. Um, we can go on to management reasons for, for confirmation. Um, so, you know, functional skeletal design, uh, there's, there's always a, a need to kind of keep an eye on that. Uh, movement, how well are they moving? How well are they tracking? Uh, you know, dimensions, width, width, length, depth. And does it fit your body type goals, right? So um, Tim, Tim also produces Tunis uh, at his purebred operation. And we both have an interest in producing uh, sheep that tunis that are uh, able to be shown slick shorn. So if you're not familiar with this breed, uh, traditionally they are a fat tailed breed uh, that have a rather sloped rump. Um, so over time, genetically, we have selected to try and level those hips and level those tops out. Uh, and we have uh, called for, for those traits as well. So if they, if they had too slopey of a hip, if they weren't wide enough, uh, or thick enough and had enough muscle, uh, we were kind of calling on some of those confirmation reasons. Another one that we could talk about and put in this category is uh, seasonal breeders. So if you are looking to keep uh, an out of season breeding section on your, uh, on your farm, um, this is also a place that you kind of want to think about that as well. So when we move into uh, genetic reasons, uh, breed character is one, especially when we're talking about uh, purebred operations. Um, breed character should be very uh, near and dear to your heart. Uh, when we're talking about calling, uh, try and keep that, that breed in that genetic line as, as much as we can. Um, prolapses are another one that's fairly genetic when we talk about it. Uh, Tim, do you wanna talk about dwarfs, spider and scrapey? <laughs> Yeah, uh, and some commercial people may not be familiar with this dwarf gene, but basically it's a it's a simple recessive gene that uh, uh, you know does just basically normal lambs that are just extremely small and uh, just never grow to their full you know, genetic what you would expect potential, so they just kind of end up being cute and small. Uh, spider. Uh, the spider gene also a simple recessive and if you go back several years ago it was probably a little bigger issue now we do have uh, tests uh, genetic tests uh, for all three of these so you can send in a tissue sample from any uh, any of your sheep or a sheep you would purchase and find out uh, you know what the dwarf gene would be uh, a non-carrier would be uh, uh, f f uh, the D is recessive, and in the spider, the N is, uh, uh, the S is receptive, so recessive. So, and then the scrapey, uh, we're all familiar with that, and there's been, uh, you know, work there that we know the RRs tend to have a higher resistance than the QRs, but again, another simple recessive there. So, uh, in the purebred operations, uh, it's a real premium if you, uh, you know, have uh, homozygous FF, NN, and RR. And, uh, you know, they bring, uh, uh, breeders tend to be selecting those now just so they don't have to worry about those traits in their flock. 
Another uh, genetic uh, reason that we would have for, for culling is the under overbite on their mouth. So a, a mouth structure in general. Um, this not only causes uh, nursing concerns for lambs, but also, um, you know, when we talk about getting to that feedlot finisher, uh, getting, getting grain in there and getting that good conversion. OPP is another one that we can talk about, and that's ovine progressive pneumonia. Uh, so we do know some flocks out there that are taking a, a very heavy action on this, on this culling reasons. And um, we've known some flocks that have been working very hard. Uh, they, they actually will rear those lambs from the moment they're born uh, on and get rid of those ewes so they can clear out that, that OPP in their herd. Parasite resistance is another good reason for genetic culling. And I put litter size on here. Uh, I, I don't know if it's a really good reason for genetic calling. It's actually one of the lowliest heritable traits that are that is recorded in sheep. So it's actually only 10% heritable. Um, and that's from the Ohio, or excuse me, the, uh, the American Sheep Industry Sheep Production Handbook. Um, so it's prolificacy is, is one of those things that we kind of kind of look at and keep keep an eye and, and understand that um, not always is it specifically genetic. So we got to keep that in mind. So production calling reasons, um, you know, we can straight, you know, these are just straight numbers basically, right? We can look at a number born alive, you know, do we only care about how many she, um, she has born alive, you know, a fin sheep, she could have a litter of, you know, four very easily, um, but maybe we care about the number weaned. Uh, you know, it's important sometimes to not have bottom all lambs uh, if you can keep it that way. Uh, so we want to keep those, those lambs on the ewe as much as possible. So maybe the number weaned is more important to you. Or maybe it's the gross dollar per ewe, right? So especially when we come back and, and look at this from a purebred perspective, you know, if, if a ewe has a single, but, you know, it sells for $2,500 compared to a ewe that had twins that we just took to market and only got $300 for, um, you know, which one is more more productive in our system? Uh, when we're looking at gross dollars per U, uh, obviously that first U, even with a single, is doing better for us. Um, I'm going to let Tim talk more about the EVBs. Yeah, the estimated EV estimated breeding values. Again, uh, the chart we got up here now, and, and I'm sure most people are NSIP aware of. Uh, the National Sheep Improvement Association that uh, done a lot of work in, in the past few years of getting more and more of our uh, commercial flocks and uh, our commercial U-based <laughs> flocks, uh, you know, on these type programs where you actually have uh, data. Uh, this is the most recent uh, chart from the Suffolk breed. Uh, you can see the lines there for weaning weight, post weaning weight, fat depth, and uh, uh, basically loin eye muscle depth and just look from 11 to uh, 2011 to 2020 uh, you know the movement they've made in a positive direction as you look at all three of those uh, you know categories and obviously fat depth uh, a negative number is is better there uh, no we're probably not going to change the loin eye greatly and that's uh, been worked with over the years. Uh, but again, there is some movement there. Uh, and uh, it's amazing how much growth they made in these uh, uh, ram, Suffolk rams for, uh, you know, you look at the weaning weight and the post weaning weight. It, it's really, uh, really interesting. And surely the basis for the future, a lot of my backgrounds in the swine industry were, uh, Numbers is, is totally the way you make uh, progress. Uh, a lot of benchmarking goes on. And this is the real first experience we're seeing more and more of benchmarking in the sheep industry where you can uh, actually compare your, your flock to others. So yeah, let's go to the next slide, Jackie. And uh, these are some of the different traits they're tracking and that you can track some of the breeds. Uh, I know Katahdin's have been extremely uh, progressive in, the, in this type of information, Suffolk's also, Targi's also, but you know, you can get an estimated breeding value for birth weight, uh, maternal birth weight, weaning weight, uh, maternal weaning weight, post weight, and even you can uh, come back with yearling weights. But again, to, for your own flock, you have to be set up to record all this information and uh, be able then to submit it and then you will get a yearly summary and uh, it's 
provides a lot of solid information to make good sound uh, sound uh, decisions that are based on information. And there another slide here, Jackie, or some other, th or, these are for the wool traits and maybe not as many of us, uh, you know, put a lot of emphasis on this, but surely there are some of our breeds out there that's still extremely important, uh, even at the level, I guess, the wool market is currently at, but uh, weight, your uh, fiber diameter, staple length, and just all those things you can, you know, there's estimated feeding values, select a ram or select your replacement females that are going to move you in a positive direction. Oh, a little more here on some additional traits, even they're getting now to body composition, uh, and reproduction, parasite resistance. We're getting enough numbers too, I think pretty quick, like you've seen in the beef industry and also in the swine industry, we're going to see a cross breed, uh, you know, EBVs also on down the road. So uh, really would be a positive influence for commercial producers as we look at some of these traits to help you make decisions in your purchases. So when we come back to uh, our, our kind of main reasons of why we're calling age comes up. So, um, you know, a good, a good rule of thumb uh, from the sheep, and, or sheep handbook is seven years old. The user most productive between the ages of three to six. Uh, once they hit that seven year mark, they start becoming less productive each year after that. Uh, my general rule of thumb is that we should be concerned about ewes that are over 10, uh, 10 and over. Uh, you know, we, they just aren't um, as spring chickens as they used to be. And we need to keep a, a little bit greater care and eye on those, especially during the heavy lambing um, season, as well as when they are uh, heavy with lambs and they're full of weight. This kind of comes back to our very first statement about generation interval. You know, in order to create change, you need to have more younger ewes. Uh, so in the purebred industry, in the show industry, we're always trying to move towards a different goal. And that shorter generation interval is how we can make that change in a more quicker time. Disease resistance or disease level, uh, right? So we talked about OPP already. Um, you know, we kind of think uh, that there's definitely some, some work going on out there. Uh, soft hooved ewes, like we talked about, there's the increased likelihood of foot rot. Um, ewes that have a, a more of a, a white or, or red hoof compared to a black hoof are, are gonna be softer and they actually have that um, increased likelihood of foot rot and um, you know contamination of, of wet uh, pastures is always an issue when we talk about a white hoofed ewe compared to a black hoof for you. And Going back to the very first webinar we had, that ring womb, that cervix not dilating, uh, that is a, there is genetic components to that. So we wanna be sure that we're kind of calling that out of our herd. Um, C-sections, you know, we really wanna be kind of reason specific on this. Here you see a goat uh, with a very, very large uh, baby coming out of there. You know, if, if she would have had twins instead, which we, we believe is more in controlled environmentally than compared to um, genetically, you know, that we probably wouldn't have had to have a C-section. So just keep in mind uh, those reasons specific. However, you know, if you're having a C-section because it's a ring womb scenario, uh, you know, maybe you do need to call her. And then abortions. When we look at abortions, we want to really look at the environment first. Uh, we, we definitely think that that has uh, a little bit more to do with it than any uh, genetics that we have going on. Hey, this is, this is my list. And uh, this is the way I go at calling. Uh, you know, I, I, we've, we've raised uh, the shrops for uh, over 50 years and the tunas for about 25. Uh, my my policy is pretty simple, uh, you know. If, if they don't lamb, uh, they're gone. Uh, you know, if uh, if the udder is not you know sound or ha even half an udder, I guess the older I get, the less uh, sympathetic I, I am for you know that half udder because she'll have twins every time, and then you need to to just uh, artificially rear those lambs. Uh, broken mouth, uh, most of the time we're introducing ge new genetics so quick we don't run into this, but through the years there's been a couple of years that just were so good and you kept around so long. Uh, body condition score, if they're thin, um, you know, it, it's, there, there's generally a reason, 
And, uh, you know, it's probably easier just to, to call that and just uh, work with those that are responding to you, the environment you're working with. Chronic foot problems gone real quick. Again, the older I get there, uh, it's just uh, physically harder to catch you, set them up and trim feet. And uh, again, just uh, the ones that have problems tend to, you know, keep having those problems. Abortions, I, I, you know, maybe, uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of biosecurity. I learned that from the hog business. Uh, I, I think if you, as you buy sheep or as you trade rams, as you move ewes to other people's, uh, you know, farm to get bread, uh, it's just the opportunity to bring some of their problems back to your home environment. Uh, and I, I think especially buying older, mature ewes, uh, I, I think that's the highest risk level in, in my my mind. So I, I don't trade rams much anymore, and I, I don't buy many ewes at all to bring into our environment. Prolapse uterus, I, I think a little bit of that depends on the age you're, you're breeding these ewes. Uh, when we breed a lot of ewe lambs, if you don't get them, uh, let them get mature enough, uh, you know, a prolapse uterus can can happen, you know, periodically. It normally happens about 1 or 2 a.m. on a cold morning, and you need to address that uh, fairly quickly. Vaginal prolapses, uh, again, there's several reasons, but I think genetics is, is probably the, the one there, so we watch that pretty closely uh, and try to just, uh, you know, get rid of these problems, and it's just much more fun to uh, work with sheep that don't have problems. So uh, our calling policy at our farm is uh, three strikes and you're out. Um, so, but there are some offenses that are actually worth two strikes um, and, and you get moved to the, to the front of the list a little bit quicker. So uh, some of those for us is a breed character. So um, we are in the purebred business and we, we keep an eye on that fairly quickly. Uh, mothering ability is also worth two strikes. If you cannot claim your own lambs, then you are not worth staying around. Um, we, we, you know, I say three strikes and you're out. Um, it, these, these are worth two strikes and it's somewhat easy for us to find another third strike to put on there if we need to. But we start looking for those third strikes a little bit harder. Uh, and then mouth structure is another one that we definitely call pretty hard on. So um, in summary, uh, it's easy for me to go, just come up here and say, get rid of that one, keep this one. Um, you know, Keep healthy, productive use. If they're healthy and they're productive, and they're young enough, um, keep them. Call ewes that are not healthy and are not productive. Uh, in general, we wanna keep that our flock as healthy as healthy and productive as possible. So that's kind of the, the, you know, the black and white, the Vegas answer I can give you. Um, uh, Tim has on here, do not have, uh, do not name them. Um, high emotional content connection can actually hurt that bottom line. Um, so uh, use that you have that high emotional connection to that, um, stay around for 10 years or longer um, can really start hurting that bottom line, like we said. And uh, if you smile when you enter your barn, you're, you're doing everything you're doing, or excuse me, every morning you're going on the right track. So like we talked about, you know, we, we select for certain things that we want or that we like. Um, so what it finds your purpose and select towards that. That is what I have. I will try to stop sharing my screen. There we go. Thank you so much, Jackie and Tim. We've had a lot of questions coming and going in the chat and also the Q&A. And um, I wanna address this one before it gets lost in the chat. We had one just come in from Nikki. She asked, what is the genetic component to ring womb? Is this calcium use, mobilization? Uh, what's your comment in regard to that question? Uh, who's going to fire on that first? Go ahead, Tim. I'll, no, uh, let, I'll my, let you cancel. Experience tell, I, I, I guess I'm old school on this. Uh, uh, I almost think it's uh, more weather related, uh, a little stress related than, than a genetic issue. Uh, but uh, that's, I, I've never, knock on wood, had a big problem with that. But uh, there's generally a weather stress or something to me related with, uh, you know, when that does happen. Brady, what do you think? 
I plead the fifth on that one. <laughs> no, I was actually just, uh, I saw that comment come in in the chat and uh, I was on my phone here and I was actually reading a thesis, a master's thesis from West Virginia University discussing um, the uh, ethology of ring women and the attributes to it. And uh, you didn't let me get far enough to take a look and see if there was any genetic component to it. So um, if you would, Nikki, follow up with me. I got my email in the chat box. We'll, we'll have a discussion about uh, ring womb further. I'm interested as well. Yeah, I mean, the answer to a lot of these questions is just about keeping records over time. And sometimes there's many traits that we might think maybe this is heritable and maybe it's not. So many people go with the singles, doubles, triplets as criteria. And that's one of the least heritable traits as we just learned from that presentation, but people still go by it because that's one of the traits they know and have documented that's uh, referenceable. So we'll follow up with that ring room question. We have a, some others that we've marked to answer live here. Um, let's go to the, the question about dairy farm calling rates. So Haley has asked us, Dairy farms calling rate increases with increasing herd size. Is there an ideal voluntary calling rate for small ruminant operations based on flock numbers? This is a little complicated to answer because it is highly variable from one operation to the next. Um, depending on how many publications you read, uh, the number that floats around there is usually somewhere between 10 and 15% from what I have referenced, um, but that's gonna vary a lot from one year to another. As Jackie and Tim have elaborated on and as we'll see in the next presentation. In, in, a dairy, in a dairy operation too, I think some of this is gonna be a reflection of production. And going back to that first slide we talked about, you know, if you, know, if you bring a young female into any species, uh, you know, she needs to produce pretty quick. And, uh, you know, you need to, because you got a cost incurred to get her in there, to keep her, to maintain her, to get her bred. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think better records, whether you're weighing the milk or weighing the lambs, I don't care how you do it, but uh, it, I think it needs to be sound economically based to help you, uh, you know, decide which ones to keep. Yeah, I mean, and like we referenced, right, that, that, that 10 to 15% is kind of what floats around there. But, you know, if you're wanting to make a higher change at a faster rate, then obviously um, your calling rate's going to be higher and your, your, you know, replacement use are going to be, or does are going to be at a higher rate coming in as well. We have quite a few questions and we um, want to get through a few more before we do our next presentation. But some of these questions will be answered as well from the more commercial aspect of things moving forward. But let's go back to another question related to abortions and potential causes for abortions. Mm -hmm. uh, Ken has asked what environmental conditions contribute to abortions. So Tim touched on it a little bit, you know, bringing, bringing new use in, bringing, um, you know, rams in and out um, can, can transfer some of those. So there's anything from your chlamydias to your campylobacters to vibrio to toxoplasmosis, you know, that, I mean, that's spread by cats as well. So there's lots of different environmental factors that could contribute to some abortion scenarios. Um, so that, I guess that's kind of what I was getting at with the environmental factors. I think biosecurity is something the sheep industry and any species, we just need to be more and more aware and biosecurity is kind of this COVID thing is when we you know, went into lockdown, that was more or less biosecurity, you know, keep your distance from people. And, and uh, you know, I, I think that really, uh, you know, the bugs you have on your farm, you know, they build some immunity to it. Uh, the animals you have there, you bring new ones in, they bring new bugs in and they, or they may not be used to yours and that affects their productivity. Let's, um, let's address this next question about buying a new ram. Uh, Michael is thinking about buying a new ram from an NSIP producer. Thoughts? Any suggestions on where to get a new ram? 
maybe it'd be easier to give advice on where not to buy a ram i think in this <laughs> regard plenty, there's plenty of places to buy a ram i think you know what, what trade is he emphasizing if it's a commercial operation you know are, are you trying to make maternal you know replacements or are you trying to uh you know uh, top the the 60 pound lamb market i, I think that you know, and there's reputable breeders in every scenario. Yeah, I um, agree. It's, it's a no brainer with the NSIP. If you can guarantee yourself, you know, for example, two pounds per lamb more on lamb sired by a specific ram and a given market or a given breeding scenario, uh, it, it's just assurance in your pocket that you can can assure that you're going to improve the value and productivity of your flock. But as Tim said, there's plenty of, of reputable breeders. I think more questions need to be asked in terms of uh, what are the goals and aspirations of the producer in their specific operation. Uh, we've got a nice website on NSIP. Uh, I think, I believe it's NSIP.org. And you can take a look at the, the breeders lists that are available. And then they also break them down by breeds. Yeah, I think that going through NSIP is a, a one of your best ways that you can go where you're going to get the most information possible. Um, if you're working with someone one on one, I ask if they have references available, maybe from other people who have purchased rams through them so that you can get um, some more word of mouth feedback on their performance. Um, I would caution you about buying rams online um, unless you have access to that information. And I would not recommend buying rams at the livestock auction on a weekly basis. They are there for a reason and most likely are not going to be the best use of your money. So definitely do your research as you've discussed there, Michael. Let's answer these, these three remaining questions kind of as one. These are um, the three questions that remain have to do with some more specific criteria for calling and why you would or wouldn't or how many chances you would give. Um, so to put all, the, all of these together, how long do you give a barren you before deciding that she is in fact barren? Depends on your personal opinion on if you're doing no second chances or three strikes you're out. Um, I'll allow everybody to weigh in on these before we do our next presentation. I have, um, I have hey, an ultrasound machine, so it's pretty easy. I just ultrasound and she's open, she's gone. Yeah, preg checking is, is super helpful for deciding are you in fact barren or not? So the more you know, right? right. Uh, how about this? Can you elaborate on why you would not immediately call a U with a uterine prolapse? What about future uterine form and function or the impairment of rebreeding. But question, some operations will allow a second chance on that and others will not, as we'll see in our next example. And then we had another comment that is in regard uh, to teat formation and placement. Um, and this person said, just inspect and remove extra teats when they're very young. Then look at the mammary pad for number. Uh, I think that that whether you're going to implement a strategy like that or not depends on how much time you have to actually inspect utter confirmation. And um, if you believe that to be a heritable trait or not, I would think that it would be, but I'm not 100% sure if it is or not. Um, and I know that I would not like to spend my time checking everyone's memory tissue and trimming extra teats. So depending on how much time you're willing to spend on, on that aspect, um, I think it's going to determine your answer. So any additional comments on these three questions before we head into our commercial view of culling criteria? The the extra T um, comment, you know, that's it's, it's basically very similar with entropians as well, right? Like if you if you want to take time and use that management and use that labor to to fix and correct those entropians, you can definitely do that. Um, but like Christine was saying, is you know what what is your time or what is your your what is it worth to do that extra step? Um, I'm gonna jump onto the uterine prolapse real quick. Um, given experience, uh, we we have not had any, I'm gonna knock on wood, any uteruses that we have put in, we've actually been able to rebreed again uh, if we if we so choose. So some, you know, some uterine prolapses, she was already on that second strike and this uterine prolapse was her third strike and she, um, she kind of left us there. So uh, we wanna be sure that uh, 
you're kind of thinking about those things as well. I think so on the uterine prolapse, I, I, I think uh, my experience in the past is, and, and we put them in ourselves, we don't have to call the veterinarian to do it. And I, I would say probably 85, 90% of the time, we normally kept those and rebred re re them in uh, the following year and had, had no problem. But there is an exception to that always. Uh, uh, but that, that's kind of the, the way we've handled it. Excellent points. And thank you for taking the time to answer these questions. And thank you all for the participation as we continue to move through. We have one more presentation to share with you tonight, and then we'll be ending our series. We'll have a couple more follow-up uh, questions for you, and then we'll, we'll let you know how to stay in touch with us as the SHEEP team moving forward. Our next presentation is a video that um, I had the pleasure of recording last week on site at the Eastern Agricultural Research Station, which is in my background here. The Eastern Ag Research Station is located in my county, Noble County, southeast corner of the state. And uh, they have a sizable commercial block there that they lamb in two groups. And uh, we were able to have one of our research assistants aid us with the uh, following interview that we're about to watch. I hope you enjoy, and we'd be happy to follow up with additional questions uh, as the video plays. Brady, I will stop my video and allow you to share everything. Check and make sure we have sound. Dalton Hewan. I work here at the Eastern Agricultural Research Station. Uh, we're here in our sheep barn today. We, uh, we do a lot of cattle, uh, sheep, and forage research here at the station. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about our calling practices in our sheep flock. So uh, we maintain anywhere from 300 to 350 ewes uh, on a yearly basis. We lamb in two groups. We lamb a, a spring group, which are what we have right, right here. And then we lamb a fall group in, uh, starting in September. So we're here at the uh, tail end of our lambing season. We started the end of January and uh, we lambed roughly 160 ewes in about a month. So I'm going to talk to you uh, a little bit about the, the culling cycle we have on our ewes. So our main, uh, main objective in our sheep flock is we don't believe in second chances. Our sheep have one job and that's to raise a lamb. So if they can't do their job, then they have to hit the road. So our calling begins at our preg check. So we use, if they're open, we sort them off and they go to the sale directly after the uh, preg check. Um, from there, we start into lambing and that's when we begin evaluating the ewes again. So our main focus is for that ewe to raise a lamb. If she, does not own the lamb, has a bad odor, we mark her as a call and she goes. So I'll, I'll go into a little bit more depth to that. So as a ewe lambs, we bring her into our lambing room, we put the ewe and lamb pair into a jug, and that's where we start to evaluate them. So what we look for is, is the ewe owning the lamb. If she has no mothering ability, then we pay closer attention, attention to them, obviously. So from there, our approach is less hands-on. We don't want to have to touch these sheep if we don't have to. So if we have a ewe that is a good mother, milking well, we should never have to touch the lamb other than to process them, tag and ban, and then vaccination later on. So we pay close attention to the lambs and the lambing jugs, and if we have one that's not as thrifty, we'll go in, we'll check them out, uh, we'll check the bag on the ewe, and usually that's where a lot of our problems are, is mass type space. So we don't have time uh, here for half baggers per se. So our objective is to get the used bread, to get the lamb on the ground, and for the ewes to be out of the way. So if we have to bottle raise lambs, the ewe has to go. So if a ewe is half bagged, we mark them as a call. Um, if they can raise the lamb, we leave the lambs on, and then we will sort those off at weaning time and get rid of the ewes then. 
Now, uh, there are some cases where we have used that have no milk, which that means bottled lambs. So those will go in a separate pan, and we'll usually get those, get rid of those um, as soon as they're dried up. Um, now, as we go on, if a ewe does not have a lamb on at weaning, she hits the road. So um, basically, if there's no human error in the ewe losing a lamb, then it's her fault, and we believe she has to go. So most of our culling evaluation is right at the time of lambing, uh, whether it's half bag, no bag, poor mothering ability. That's what we base most of our culling off of. Uh, now further on down the road toward weaning, if we have some older ewes that aren't milking as heavy and the lambs just don't shine and they're not as thrifty, then we'll go through, sort those off, and those ewes will be sorted and called as well. Uh, just for the sheer fact that they're just not able to perform as well as what they were able to at one time. So another factor that goes into uh, who we call and when we call is uh, vaginal and rectal prolapses. So that's another thing that we deal with here. We have a few uh, vaginal prolapses a year, and that's just another thing that we don't have time to deal with in the whole second chance mindset. Um, right here we have an example of you. She had a vaginal prolapse early on in gestation, about a month and a half before lambing, which shouldn't happen. Uh, another double strike against her is she's a bad mother. So as you can see, maybe she's got a blue X on her back, and that's how we mark our calls. Uh, not so much for later on down the road when we sell them for the buyers to know, but mainly just for us as an identification piece. So if this U gets turned out with another group of 50 U's at weaning time, we can pick her out and she doesn't get biased and we find out she was a call next year this time. So that's another piece uh, that we don't deal with is if they prolapse, they're gone. Okay, so a big part of our research um, is our livestock, obviously, and records and animal identification is very important for that. So we keep very good records um, on our livestock. So here I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about our lambing sheet and everything that we keep track of. So uh, these are pre-made before lambing season. Um, this column here we have UID number, and then we have different columns, so how we do it is the day she lands, we put the date, single twin triplet, how many lambs she has, and then when we tag lambs, we put lamb tag numbers over here and sex of the lamb. Um, now out here in the, the notes section, that's where we keep track of important pieces of information. So this is where we keep track of our ewes that are called, our transplant lambs, um, bottom lambs, such of that nature. So like if we have a ewe that has a stillborn lamb, lost a lamb, this is also where we keep track of that. <laughs> Okay, so now I'll talk about um, how we evaluate our replacements uh, and how we determine what stays and what goes. So uh, we're able to call our ORUs a little harder than some people might be able to just because we have the numbers coming up and we have the numbers to choose from as replacements. So uh, what we look for mainly in our replacements, ideally we'd like to keep twins and triplets. In theory, they're going to have twins and triplets down the road, more lands equals more money. Um, that's not always the case. Sometimes we have to keep singles just to keep our numbers. So we shoot to keep shoot for 50 to 60 ewe lambs out of each lamb. Mm -hmm. So what we'll do when we go through and evaluate those is we look for our big, strong, healthy ewe lambs, uh, no structural problems, no health problems, things of that nature, um, all your common sense things. So keeping this many replacements um, allows us to call our older ewes a little harder. You know, if we have some older ewes that maybe are starting to go back on milk that could probably last another lambing season, if we don't feel like we're going to be able to manage those appropriately as they need to be managed, uh, we can go ahead and get rid of those because we have the young ewes coming up. So that allows us to call our older ewes a little harder and keep our flock uh, younger and stronger. Okay, all right, moving on to our ram criteria for culling. Um, much like our ewes, our rams have one job. If they can't breed you, then they can't stay. So our ram culling mainly happens at our breeding soundness exam. Now since we have two breeding groups in spring and the fall, that means we give BSCs to our rams twice a year. So it's not based off of age, it's not based off of performance so much, it's based off of if they have the correct motility and morphology at that scene show. 
So that's how we uh, follow around. So there's no no age limit um, per se on the rams. We use them as long as they are viable. So uh, adding on to that, um, we try to use no more than put no more than 40 ewes per ram. Uh, last year we bred this group of 160 spring lambing ewes with four rams, which is right at 40 ewes per ram. Now coming up, we kept a few ram lambs uh, two breeding seasons ago, so they'll be mature. So we will turn out eight or nine rams with a, a group this same size. So again, our, our ram calling criteria is based solely off of performance. If they can't breed the ewes and get the ewes covered, then we can't we can't keep it. Um, we don't want weak semen. Uh, we don't we want ewes strung out for three months. We want lambs in a month window. So. It might be a lot of work in that month, but if, the sooner we can get those lambs out of the ewes and the quicker, the better for us. So we want to get these lambs out of the ewes as quick as possible, and we want the lambing group as tight as possible, uh, just as a, a time and a, a marketing thing, uh, more or less. So a, lo a lot on the time and labor is, if we could spend one month down here and lamb really hard, rather than spend three months down here lambing off and on, we want to just come down here and get the use pumped out as fast as we can. Uh, we have a lot of other things going on here, so the less time we have to spend down here, the better um, in terms of time and labor. Uh, the other part of it is uh, marketing ability. So if we can get one uniform land crop, that'll make it easier for us to sell uh, when the time comes. So we don't have to manage them as three different groups weaning these, this age land at this time and having two or three other sets on down the line. Uh, if we can at all possible, we land everything in one time, or wean everything in one time, in one big group. We might have a few stragglers, but the tighter of a landing window we can have with it. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about our ram sourcing uh, a little bit now. So, all of our replacement ewe lambs are homegrown. They are born and raised here on the farm. So our main outcrop comes from our rams. So when the time comes, when we're getting low on ram numbers, ram power, we go and buy. Now we have a very good relationship with the local producer and uh, we have a very good relationship with them because we know that we're going to go buy healthy, productive animals. So we think that's really important to have that relationship and know and be able to know that you're buying something that's going to do its job, that's going to be healthy, that's going to be able to breed ewes uh, later on. <laughs> I got some weird ones here. Okay, excuse me. <laughs> She's a call for sure. <laughs> Again, we're so very thankful for it. the Eastern Ag Research Station and all of their research staff. They're always so accommodating when we ask if we can come out and film something they do or ask them to speak on an event, uh, virtual or in person. So thanks, everybody. We appreciate you. We do have a pending question right now to address, and that has to do with preg checking equipment. Uh, Michael has asked to determine if a U is open. Does the preg tone instrument work? Don't want to spend a fortune on an ultrasound machine. What are your thoughts? Tim, you're muted. Sorry. Yeah, I'll, t I'll take this. <laughs> preg tone, uh, yeah, they work. It's just, uh, you know, that signals, uh, you know, just bouncing in there in uh, a little smaller area, ultrasound is just a little more powerful and you can see a little more actually of the whole area. 
uh, you know, of the uterus. So uh, yeah, I, I know several people that use Pregtone and I, but I, Brady, has there ever been a study comparing ultrasound to Pregtone? I don't remember seeing that, but you'd have to have a, the same, uh, you know, person doing it and do some things that way. But, uh, it, it surely is a cheaper alternative. That's going to, uh, uh, you know, you may want to go, go a little later. Uh, I could, you know, we, ultrasound uh, in that 35 day period in preg tone, probably you got to go a little longer than that to get be a little more accurate. Yeah, Tim, to my knowledge, there isn't any research published out there that compares pregnancy detection uh, devices, but uh, Pregtone, I assume, is similar to what they use in the swine industry, too, where you're just right. trying it's to refract or refract those sound waves off any type of right. liquid. And the biggest issue with that is you can get some false pregnancies because if they have a full bladder, uh, you'll get that ricochet sound uh, or effect of pregnancy. So uh, my answer to that would be that you greatly reduce your accuracy. Uh, of of the tool i think your money would be more uh, your money and time would be more uh wor worth uh you know hiring a technician to do the actual scanning that has an ultrasound machine as as with anything i was the uh i also have quite a bit of hog experience as well and i was the designated preg tone person for um over five years so it, it takes uh it it takes kind of that repetitive experience over and over and over again to make sure you're getting it in that right angle to get that accurate reading. Like Brady said, it, it does just detect a um, liquid. So uh, it is easy to get to get a false pregnancy uh, where it, more of an actual ultrasound machine, you can actually see visually see some things rather than just assume that you're hopefully hitting the right area. Thank you for elaborating on that. I had no experience with the Pregtone machine and really had no idea. So this is this is interesting for me uh, to learn along with our audience in that regard. Um, that was our last pending question, but we have some pending questions still for you as participants. And please feel free to contribute more things in Q&A or the chat. Um, we'll stay on to answer those questions for you. But I'm gonna launch our last poll for the evening and it's going to ask you, do you subscribe to the OSU Sheep Team webpage? We hope that you do or will after this webinar series. We are, of course, eager to return to some in-person programming formats. I'm sure we'll continue to offer hybrid type events moving into the future, but uh, we, we encourage you to subscribe to the Sheep Team page because that's where we're going to be posting our upcoming events and programs. And as things ebb and change uh, with the develops moving later into this year, if we're able to have some in-person things, you'll find out about them there on the webpage, as well as any virtual events that we have. So about half of our respondents say that they do subscribe and half have not. <laughs> so remember, please visit sheep.osu.edu and subscribe. Do it now <laughs> because we'd love to stay in contact with you over time. Uh, we did record tonight's session. We will be posting that and sharing that with everyone that has registered for the event as soon as it is ready. We also will be following up with a program evaluation. We would really like to hear some feedback from you, what you thought of the series from beginning to end. You'll be able to indicate which webinars you did attend and provide any additional feedback you'd like for the course. We are, of course, fairly new to utilizing this webinar format as a primary means of, of education, but we've continued to learn and grow throughout it and hope that it's been widely beneficial for everyone that's joined us so far. Oh, we do have one comment in the chat. Don't forget to blood test for preg tests. Yeah, so that, that is a, a quote unquote newer option for us as well. So there are blood tests out there uh, that you can confirm pregnancy with as well. Um, you know, I guess I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I guess the only, <laughs> the only disadvantage or a couple of disadvantages of the blood test is that you have to have a skilled person that knows yeah, how to pull yeah. blood and do it correctly. Uh, you have to acquire the equipment to do it. And then also you don't know how many there are. It's either yes or no. It's pretty binary. So you can't segregate uh, based upon fetuses for feeding. Good points. And I think with any of the things that we've discussed tonight, you have to have a way to gather, handle, 
evaluate these animals on a case-by-case -case basis. If you can't group them, you can't read their tag numbers, uh, it's extremely hard to gather this information. So if you have not yet invested in some type of a handling system, some type of a chute to run your animals, I highly suggest that you invest in them, especially as your operations continue to grow and as producers begin to age because the, the amount of labor that we're willing to do uh, changes with as daring as we become. And we certainly uh, don't want you getting hurt doing foolish things because your handling system is not appropriate. So I think if you compare the cost of a visit to the emergency room versus the cost of a handling facility, uh, it starts to pay for itself pretty quickly. <laughs> so be safe out there. Regardless of the pandemic, be safe out there while you're handling your animals. Hey, additional questions, comments. Um, we're getting sheep.osu.edu doesn't seem to work. Hmm. Yes, just don't put www in yeah, front of it. In front of it, yeah. Yes, if just you try simply HTTP, just, just sheep. Just put, no, just like in your regular Google, just put sheep.osu.edu. That's one of our former handles that we used to have for our previous page, but when we updated, it's um, a bit different. Uh, but just simply sheep.osu.edu is the simpler form to place it in. Yep, just as Christine has in the uh, chat box there. If not, it's like the https dot forward slash um, u.osu.edu forward slash sheep. And it looks like that it one worked. worked. <laughs> there you go. Yay. Right. As a reminder, it's there on the left-hand side. Just scroll slightly down, stick your email in the box, and uh, Brady will have an email sent out to you tomorrow. Brady, about tomorrow. what time does that come? They go out tomorrow or every Wednesday at 11 o'clock. So uh, time can be variable based upon where you are in the subscriber list. So around that 11 o'clock uh, time period, Eastern Standard Time. Thank you. We, again, thank you to all of our speakers that have joined us, Jackie, Tim, Brady, as well as our other speakers from previous webinars. We are uh, just so thankful for the time you've taken, for your evenings, and for all of you who've joined us through these webinars as well. We value your time and hope that uh, whether you are Ohio locals or from another state, that you will connect with the extension personnel that are there available to help you. Remember, your tax dollars pay for this service and uh, we are accessible to all. Uh, so we are happy to serve you, but remember you're gonna get your best local advice from the extension personnel in your community. So consult your uh, state's land grant universities to connect with your extension personnel. Uh, we are happy to help with questions from outside of our state, but you'll get the uh, most precise help from your local folks. So we're so glad you've joined us and that we've gotten to know you don't hesitate to get to know the people in your states and your counties as well. Any additional closing thoughts, panelists? Nope, it's been fun. Yeah, hope thanks everyone, everybody. Hope everyone has had or is going to have a nice slamming season and